the Ottoman Turks founded one of history's more enduring empires, which lasted for over 600 years in its heyday, it was the world's most powerful state. At its greatest extent, the Ottoman realm stretched from modern Algeria in the west to the Caspian Sea in the east, and from Hungary in the north to Yemen in the south. Following are 20 lesser known facts about the Ottoman Empire of the Turks. Number 20. A fiendish solution to reduce dynastic strife. Throughout history, many kingdoms collapsed into chaos, and many ruling dynasties perished because of infighting by royal siblings competing for the throne, such dynastic civil wars weakened states, further their resources be they blood, or treasure on useless strife, and left them vulnerable to foreign rivals. The Ottoman Turks tackled that problem head-on, with one of the most ruthless solutions possible, as soon as a new Ottoman sultan ascended the throne, he immediately executed all his brothers, the prospects of deadly rivalries and civil wars were thus eliminated by the simple expedient of eliminating all potential male claimants to the throne. It was cruel, but it worked, at least insofar as reducing the odds of dynastic civil wars, however, as seen below there were severe downsides to this Ottoman expedient. Number 19. Any of my sons who ascends the throne, it is acceptable for him to kill his brothers. The early Ottoman state had no clear-cut rules of succession, when princes reached puberty, their father the sultan usually sent them out to govern a province, there, they often built up a power base of ambitious followers, eager to prosper by urging their royal governor to make a bid for the throne upon his father's death. Thus, the death of a sultan was often followed by a bout of civil war between his sons, and the early reign of a new sultan was often marred by the revolts of envious brothers seeking to take his place. Eventually, Sultan Mehmed II the conqueror enacted a law of governance, stating in relevant part, any of my sons who ascends the throne, it is acceptable for him to kill his brothers for the common benefit of the people. The majority of the ulama Muslim scholars approve this. Let action be taken accordingly. Number 18. The Ottoman Sultan who kicked off his reign by executing his 19 brothers. Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II's successors usually heeded his advice to maintain the stability of the realm by preemptively executing their brothers upon ascending the throne, it was a cruel expedient, but it worked, for the next two centuries, the Ottoman Empire was remarkably stable and free of infighting, and civil wars when compared to its contemporaries, however, although the system worked, the consciences of many throughout the realm were bothered by the murder of innocent royal siblings at the start of each reign. Those misgivings reached a peak, when Sultan Mehmed III inaugurated his reign by ordering his 19 brothers, some of them mere infants strangled to death, it was said that the empire wept as a long line of child-sized coffins exited the palace in a grand procession the next day. Number 17. Cage your brothers instead of kill them. Eventually, a reaction set in against the Ottoman tradition of fratricide, so a new tradition was developed to take its place. Instead of new sultans outright murdering their siblings upon ascending the throne, they simply locked them up, thus was born the system of the Ottoman calves or cage whereby sultans set up a secluded part of their royal harem as a detention center for their brothers. There, in the calf's potential rivals to the throne were kept under house arrest, under surveillance by palace guards, and isolated from the outside world to prevent intrigues and plots. As seen below, life in the calf's could be rough, however, for those living in it, by dint of the very fact that they were still living at all, meant that it usually beat the alternative. Number 16 death might have been preferable to getting locked up by this Ottoman sultan. Unlike many of his predecessors, Sultan Murat IV did not murder his siblings upon ascending the throne, instead he settled for locking them up inside his harem in the calf's or cage, while the calf system was set up as a more merciful alternative to how prior generations of Ottoman rulers had dealt with their brothers, it might not have been much of a mercy in Murad's case. Many of Murad's imprisoned siblings might have wished that their brother had simply gotten it over and done with, and executed them at the start of his reign, instead of an immediate end to their sufferings they were subjected to years and decades of terror, often ending in death anyhow and psychological torture. Number 15. Killing fishermen for fun Murad IV combined paranoia with sadism, he constantly suspected his captive brothers of plotting against him, and never tired of trying to entrap them into saying any careless thing, that could remotely be interpreted as validating his suspicions, Murad sent seemingly sympathetic guards or servants to try and draw out this or that imprisoned brother into uttering anything that could be seen as treasonous. Any slip of the tongue could result in an imprisoned sibling getting accused of plotting against the sultan, 
who was just itching for an excuse to execute his brothers, that eagerness to shed blood was unsurprising, considering that Murad's entertainment included shooting arrows to kill any unwary fisherman, whose boats drifted too close to his seaside palace. Number 14. A Sultan Whose Mother Had to Coax Him Out Like a Kitten With Food Sultan Ibrahim I, also known as the Mad Sultan, reigned 1640-1648, was imprisoned in the cast at age 8, when his brother Murad IV ascended the throne in 1623. While in the cast, Murad executed his other brothers, one by one until only Ibrahim was left, dreading when his turn would come, he remained in confinement until he was suddenly dragged out of the cast, to ascend the throne following Murad's death in 1640. Ibrahim refused to accept at first, instead, he rushed back into the calves to barricade himself inside, suspecting it was a cruel trick to entrap him into saying, or doing something that his fratricidal brother would take as treasonous, only after Murad's dead body was brought to the door for him to examine. And the intercession of his mother, Kosum who had to coax him out like a kitten with food, was Ibrahim convinced to accept the throne. Number 13. Encouraging the Mad Sultan to spend time in the harem, the years of isolation in the cast, and the constant terror that he might get executed at any moment, had unhinged Ibrahim and left him unfit to rule, already known to be mentally unstable, his condition was worsened by depression over the death of his brother Murad IV, whom he apparently loved in a Stockholm Syndrome type of way, an early worrying sign was the new sultan's habit of feeding the fish in the palace pool with coins instead of food. As it became clear that Ibrahim was crazy, his mother Kosum ruled in his stead, she encouraged him to spend as much time as possible in the harem with his nearly 300 concubines, to keep him out of her hair and out of trouble, she also wanted him to father male heirs since, by then thanks to the tradition of Ottoman fratricide, Ibrahim was the dynasty's last surviving male. Number 12. Kinky Crazy For years, Ibrahim took to the harem with relish, fathering three future sultans and a number of daughters, as a contemporary put it, in the palace gardens he frequently assembled all the virgins, made them strip themselves naked, and neighing like a stallion ran amongst them and as it were ravished one or the other, until he woke up one morning, and it in a fit of madness ordered his entire harem tied in weighted sacks and drowned in the Bosporus. When he saw the beautiful daughter of the Grand Mufti, the empire's highest religious authority, he asked for her hand in marriage, aware of Ibrahim's depravities, the Grand Mufti urged his daughter to decline, when she did, Ibrahim ordered her kidnapped and carried to his palace, where he ravished her for days, before sending her back to her father. Number 11. Fat Women and Furs Sultan Ibrahim also had a fetish for fat women, on one occasion, he saw a herd of cattle and got turned on by a cow's vagina, so he ordered copies made of gold and sent them around the empire with inquiries to find a woman similarly endowed. A 350-pound woman with matching parts was eventually found in Armenia, taken to Ibrahim's harem, she became one of his favorite concubines, he also had a fetish for fur, decorating his clothes, curtains, walls, and furniture with it, he also stuffed his pillows with it and preferred to have sex on sable furs. Number 10. The Crazy Catches Up With The Mad Sultan Eventually, Sultan Ibrahim exiled his mother, and assumed personal control of the government, the results were disastrous. After ordering the execution of his most capable ministers, he spent profligately until he emptied the treasury, even as he got himself into a series of wars and managed them poorly. By 1647, between heavy taxes to pay for his extravagant lifestyle, and for the bungled wars, and with a Venetian blockade, that brought the Ottoman capital to the brink of starvation, discontent boiled over. In 1648, the population revolted, Urged on by religious scholars and were joined by the army, an angry mob seized Ibrahim's grand vizier and tore him to pieces, and the sultan was deposed in favor of his six-year-old son, a fatwa was then issued for Ibrahim's execution, which was carried out by strangulation on August 18, 1648. Number 9. The Sultan's Palace Was a Claustrophobic Snake Pit Life in the Ottoman Sultan's Palace was no bed of roses not even for the sultan, Throughout much of the Ottoman era, it was deemed unseemly for a sultan to speak too much, so a form of sign language evolved, and the ruler spent most of the day surrounded by silence. Those in the palace intrigued non-stop, as courtiers, viziers, eunuchs, and women of the harem jockeyed for power. The powerful eunuchs split along racial lines, and the chief black eunuch and the chief white eunuch were fierce rivals, 
Protocol demanded that the Sultan be escorted wherever he went by huge train of attendees, causing one ruler to complain, if I go to one of the rooms, 40 pages are lined up. If I have to put on my trousers, I do not feel the least comfort, so the sword bearer has to dismiss them. Number 8. The Sultanate of Women For the most part, the Ottoman Sultan's harem was not a Hugh Hefner-esque playground of sensual pleasures, Instead, it was more of a dumping ground in which hundreds of royal female relatives, concubines, and wives were kept, most of them bored out of their minds with little to do. However, some powerful harem women managed to wield great influence over a stretch of 130 years, circa 1533 to 1656, that period came to be known as the Sultanate of Women. During the Sultanate of Women, imperial wives known as Haseki Sultans, and mothers of sultans known as valid sultans, often wielded great political and social power, that enabled them to influence the daily running of the Ottoman Empire, the appointment, dismissal and sometimes execution of its foremost officials. Number 7. An Ottoman army once won a victory without even showing up. By the 18th century, the Ottoman Empire was past its prime as an expansive military heavyweight, and was well on its way to the status of a hapless giant with clay feet. However, the Ottoman military in the late 1700s still retained an aura of prestige from past accomplishments, that was enough in at least one instance to gain it a victory without even showing up. It happened during the Austro-Turkish War of 1787-1791, between the Habsburg and Ottoman empires that conflict witnessed one of history's most catastrophic and farcical, friendly fire incidents, it occurred in the Battle of Karantsevs, in 1788. During that engagement, an Austrian Habsburg army killed and wounded over 10,000 of its own men, routed itself, and scattered in panicked flight without an enemy in sight. Number 6. A drunken brawl sets the ball in motion. The Austrian Habsburgs ruled a diverse and multi-ethnic empire or army, reflecting that diversity was made of units drawn from various ethnic groups, most of whom could not understand each other's languages, during the night of September 21-22, 1788. Austrian hussars crossed a river to scout, but found no Turks, but found some gypsies who sold them schnapps, soon the hussars were rip-roaring drunk. While the hussars were getting smashed back in their camp, the Austrian commander grew concerned, when the scouts were late in returning, so he sent some infantry across the river to check, the infantry found the hussars, and demanded a share of the schnapps, the hussars refused, a brawl ensued and it escalated into an exchange of gunfire. During that fight an infantryman had the clever idea of pranking the hussars by shouting Turks Turks, that caused the inebriated hussars to pick up the cry, and flee in panic while screaming Turks Turks, they were joined by many infantrymen, unaware that the alarm had been a prank shouted by one of their comrades, it got worse. Number 5. Culmination of a Comedy of Errors While the fracas between drunken hussars, an infantryman was going on, the Austrian camp stirred uneasily at the sounds of distant gunfire and screams across the river, when the mob of panicked hussars and infantry neared the camp, shouting Turks Turks. They were challenged by sentries, who shouted at them to halt. Halt that was misheard by some non-German speaking soldiers as Allah. Allah. In the ensuing tumult an artillery officer reasoned that the camp was under attack, and ordered his cannons to open fire. As soldiers woke up to the sounds of combat, Startled and confused some began firing wildly. Within minutes, the panic and wild firing spread and engulfed the camp. Soon, entire regiments were firing volleys at each other, before the entire army dissolved and scattered in panicked flight. The Ottoman army arrived two days later, and captured the Austrian camp, where they found 10,000 dead and wounded Habsburgs. Number 4. The Ottoman Empire tried to reform, but couldn't. By the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire had entered a period of terminal decline, the days of dynamic sultans and military prowess were long gone, mediocre and inept rulers succeeded each other, while military defeats and a steady shrinking of Ottoman territory became the norm, what had once been a vibrant state was reduced to a backwards realm, that came to be known as the sick man of Europe, it owed its continued existence not to its own abilities, but to the inability of European powers to agree on how to divide it amongst themselves. In the mid-19th century, structural reforms were attempted, with the hope of liberalizing and modernizing the crumbling Ottoman Empire, they foundered on the rocks of religious and social conservatism, inertia, and entrenched corruption that resisted all efforts at cleaning up the system, so the Ottomans staggered on, going from setback to setback until World War I, when they joined the wrong side, 
and effectively signed the empire's death warrant. Number 3. Resistance Movements in Eastern versus Western Europe It is true that Eastern European resistance movements, such as the Soviet and Yugoslav partisans, contributed materially to victory with intense and widespread sabotage and guerrilla activities. By contrast, the greatest contribution of Western Europe's resistance lay in intelligence gathering. Their sabotage and guerrilla efforts were negligible. It took great courage, and the men and women of the Western European resistance risked their lives on a daily basis. Nonetheless, their impact was more symbolic than substantive. The actual impact lay in contributing more to Western Europeans' pride and self-esteem after the war for having done something, not in having greatly contributed to the actual winning of the war. Number 2. The degree of German brutality in different parts of Europe impacted the intensity of the resistance. The disparity between the resistance movements in Eastern Europe and the Balkans versus those of Western Europe is due to the manner in which the German occupiers treated their conquered subjects. In different parts of Europe, Jews accepted German occupation of Western Europe, while Severe never approached the levels of psychotic cruelty and mindless brutality meted out to the conquered in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. With the exception of communists, who made a drastic turn from acquiescence to German occupation, during the period of Soviet-German friendship to fierce resistance, after Hitler attacked the USSR, Western European civilian populations generally did not exhibit a willingness to risk the horrific reprisals and atrocities the Germans were prepared to inflict upon troublesome subjects. It was not due to lack of courage, but lack of incentive. Number 1. Harsher Nazi treatment of the occupied in Eastern Europe led to more intense resistance than in Western Europe. In general, the Germans did not treat the occupied peoples of Western Europeans nearly as atrociously as they did Soviet or Yugoslav civilians, thus Western Europeans' backs were not as much against the wall too, where they felt they had nothing to lose. As a result, Western Europeans never flocked to the resistance in the kinds of numbers that transformed it into a mass popular movement as happened in the Balkans and the USSR. During the war, the resistance in Western Europe was not as widespread or intense as is often depicted in film or fiction. Far more people were willing to accept German occupation and make the best of a bad situation than were willing to resist and risk German vengeance. For example, far more Frenchmen collaborated with the German occupiers than joined the resistance. Indeed, the French resistance's numbers only boomed following the successful Allied landings in Normandy, after which later rivals swelled the resistance ranks.